Okay, we're going to go through how um, a laser reads information off a CD. Now, the principles behind this are very similar when you scale it to DVDs, Blu-rays, laser discs. They're all kind of the same principle, except the numbers just change and a few other layers and how it's physically made and what laser is used and stuff like that. A lot of technical data changes, but the principle is still the same. Um, now, I refer you to the pages uh, 65 to 67. There's actually more information than that in the textbook. It actually starts on page 60. But what you find, most of those pages uh, have a disclaimer saying this part is not examinable. There's a lot of information about how analog signals get converted into digital signals, how digital information gets converted back to analog, how the CD is actually made, all this other stuff. Not critically important, not stuff you'd be examined on, but that's just there for a bit more background. But I think I'm going to summarize just the particular things that you need to know for um, what you're going to be examined on. Now, some background information. If you're not, if you're not familiar with the interference of coherent light, uh, the idea that uh, two, two coherent light sources are merging on a source with path difference may um, cause a phase change, may cause structural interference, then you probably need to read up on that. Um, and if you're not familiar with transmission diffraction gratings, which was one of the videos I made recently as well, um, you better have a look through that as well, because I'm going to skip over that stuff pretty quickly and just explain how they use in this particular case. All right. So what we've got here, this little pigeon here, um, this is a pretty good labeled, um, this looks like a uh, kind of a Disman from the 1990s. Uh, these were all um, pretty cool back then. Uh, they're a bit annoying to uh, carry around. The CD, uh, if you were to move, like you walk around one of these, uh, the CD would actually skip a lot, um, and they used to make ones that uh, would um, uh, accelerate the speed and read it faster and have a bit of a uh, working memory, uh, where they, they would vibrate like crazy. <clears throat> um, they, they got better in time, but no, uh, once uh, you could actually have, um, uh, like once the first uh, iPods came along and you didn't need um, mechanical devices like spinning disc or um, magnetic tape, uh, these things got phased out as portable, but you still have them. Uh, mostly they're stationary or mounted in a car. And the car is mostly smooth enough that um, the CD is pretty effective in that case. <clears throat> now, we've got a picture here of what the CD kind of looks up, uh, uh, looks like under a microscope. Um, this might actually be an electron microscope, just given the grayscale. Uh, but in any case, um, what you see here is you've got some bumps. We're going to refer those as bumps. Um, uh, so these, these refer to as pits, but we're going to call the smooth part on the bottom the land, and we're going to call these little elevated parts the uh, bumps. All right, so in the case of the DVD, similar principle, uh, but you can see the numbers are scaled down as they get small and Blu-ray the same. More or less, the principle of what's going on here is very similar. All right, now... In the case of a, uh, a CD, uh, we have a laser. So here's our laser. We'll get into a few, a little bit of detail about the laser in a minute. But the laser here is, um, it has a certain uh, uh, diameter. That's actually important um, for reasons we'll see in a minute. Now, this laser is over what we refer to as a lamp. So it's over the lamp. Uh, when it's over a land, it's basically, that's kind of silvered, so it just reflects the light back. So if the laser beam is over a land, it's all returning because it all hits the same surface um, together. So you have a, um, a high-intensity reflected uh, beam that's picked up on the photocell. The photocell detects the light intensity coming off that. Okay. Um, all right. So... Uh, the, so for the CD, the wavelength is about 780 nanometers, which puts it in the near infrared. 
So it's actually just outside visible range. Now, this actually changes in the plastic. So when we talk about um, uh, the light in a vacuum, okay, we're, we're working on the assumption that we're working at the speed of light in a vacuum. Air is very similar. Its refractive index is very close to that of a vacuum. So we say, okay, it's a wavelength is about uh, 780. Now, inside the plastic, the speed of light is reduced. Inside all dense transparent media, you're going to have a refractive index which is greater than one. All right, in this case, the plastic that's used for the CD has a refractive index of 1.55. And this will reduce the speed of light in the plastic by uh, 1.55. And that, um, so you divide the speed of light by 1.55. That's going to also affect, in the wave equation, remember that frequency times by wavelength equals wave speed. So the way that we deal with that is we're going to refer to the change in terms of the wavelength not the frequency. Reasons for that will be discussed in the photon chapter. But we're going to, to uh, satisfy the equation um, and to satisfy what actually goes on here, so we can demonstrate this in a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about the wavelength of light inside the plastic that's reading the information off the disk. Um, well, it, that is reflected off the disk. I'd say the, uh, the photocell reads the intensity, but we'll get to that in a minute. But what's happening in terms of the interference pattern inside the plastic has to do with a wavelength of 503 nanometers. All right, that's important. All right. Now, the bumps are designed to have a height of about 110 nanometers. Now, we say that's approximately one quarter of the wavelength of this light. So the 503, um, approximately one quarter, divide that by four, you get a number close to 110. It doesn't have to be perfect, um, but it's about one quarter. And we'll see why that's important in a minute. Okay, now, our laser beam has moved across. It's moved across here. Well, more, more particular laser beams probably still um, actually been still. It's actually the disc has spun around such that we're looking over this section. Okay, now you notice that you've got that um, diameter of your laser beam. It is over a bump. But part of it is over a land as well. So the top and bottom bits are on the land, whereas the, top, the middle bit is over a bump. And we'll say that about 35% of the, land, the light is reflected off the bump and 65% of the land. Okay, now what happens is the light that's reflected off the land, okay, that's returning first to the, um, towards the photocell. Now, the light that's reflected off the top and bottom parts, the bump, they have to travel down one quarter wavelength and then back up one quarter wavelength. So in total, the part of the light that has gone over the bump, um, sorry, um, yeah, has a path difference to that which has gone to the land and back up again. The, difference, the path difference between these two parts of the light is nearly one half wavelength. So that causes some measure of destructive interference. And in this case, we get a lower intensity light returned to the photocell. So here, when it's just over the land, you get high intensity light. When it's over a bump, you get destructive interference it's not completely dark because the numbers aren't perfect, but you get a lower line intensity. That's what's important. Now, how does that affect it? Now, as the, the laser beam goes over sections, there's a, there's a timer, and it says, okay, has, a, has there been a change in line intensity? And it's either, okay, is the, light, is the line intensity consistent with what was before? If that's the case, it returns a zero in your digital information. Now, if there is a change, so if it's gone from a land to a bump or a bump to a land, there's been a change of line intensity from bright to darker, from bright to dim, or from dim to bright. If there is a change in line intensity, it returns a one. And this is how the laser beam reads the information off here. So if I was to follow one of these tracks and I say, okay, 
I'm over here. All right, I'm returning a bright signal. Now I'm returning a dark. Okay, I get. Um, okay, that's a one. All right, it's about to. It's still. Um, it's still dark. Okay, we're returning a uh, a zero. Oh, now we've changed to um, a bright. That's a one. Now we change to dark. That's a one because it's changing again. Change back to bright. Okay, that's a one. Still bright, zero, still bright, zero, still bright, zero. Um, so as it changes between bright and dark, it returns a one. As there is no change, it returns a zero. So that's how that information, which is in this pattern of uh, bumps and lands, uh, gets, um, gets communicated in terms of a binary signal one to zero. Now, if you want to have more information as to how that gets changed into analog, uh, signal like sound or how you want that um, how sound is recorded and changed into digital signal you can read up from page 60 but it's not something you're going to get assessed on so leave that up to you if you wish to read up further on that okay now the other part you're going to get examined on is how the laser stays on track now if we're talking about a music CD so just a CD you buy from a CD shop that's just has music on it it spirals from the inside out. So it starts inside and it moves outwards. Now, there are some automatic processes with the CD and there's some that are not. One of the automatic processes is basically, it starts up in the middle. So this is a, looks like a music CD um, recorder. So I, I thought it just looks like a regular discman. Um, it starts from, yeah, it starts from here. It will move outwards in time. Uh, but it does that um, using a particular feedback mechanism that we're going to talk about. One thing that is actually automatic is uh, when the laser is here, it's going to, the, the disc is actually going to spin slower than when it's further, is that right? Um, think about it. Okay, so the inside track, well, you've got a shorter distance in the circumference anyway. So yes, I think when you're on the inside track, it's go, it's, the disc will spin slower. And when you're outside track, it's going to spin faster. Or maybe I've got that backwards. But um, there is a there is a there is something to be said about the period and time it takes. Um, well, basically, um, the, the, the period is not going to be, have to stay consistent. Um, the... If it was a spin at the same speed at all times, it would. Uh, but when you're on the outside track, actually, sorry, the outside track has to be slower because there's more information to read because it's a larger circumference. Okay, so it's actually, sorry, faster in the, in the, um, at the start and slower at the end. That's actually something that when the laser is in a certain position, it gives, um, so when the laser is in a certain position, you'll fit, you know, there's a feedback to um, how fast this motor spins. <clears throat> okay. But the laser is not instructed to move outwards uh, automatically in a pattern to, uh, that would um, uh, tell it, okay, where this information is going to be ahead of time. Uh, it relies on a feedback mechanism from um, secondary light sources that's actually produced with a diffraction grating. So what we have, uh, diffraction grating, I hope you've already covered that, if not, worthwhile looking up what the fraction gradients are and what these um, first order maximums are and how they're produced. All right, they follow this diagonal pattern. So um, the, the CD is spinning to the left. So effectively the, the laser is uh, roughly stationary for the moment, it will correct in a minute, but it is moving, effectively it's reading the information from left to right, as we see here, because the CD is moving the opposite direction. All right. Um, so we see this pattern as a straight line. The, C, the CD is actually spiraling outwards because it can't just go back over itself. Uh, you would have a, um, a repeating record. Um, so what happens then is eventually it's going to come off track because this thing actually requires the laser to move outwards to spiral outwards. So, but we will look at it both ways. So the, the central one is the one that reads the information and returns the um, digital signal. 
that uh, reads the information that uh, plays your music. Okay, the secondary ones keep the laser on track. So the first order, we call them the first order diffraction maximums uh, because they are the um, one wavelength uh, diffraction, uh, transmission diffraction grading um, reinforcement maximums by um, the D sine theta equals M lambda. Okay, so what happens when these two um, get off course? Now, in, the, in this first case, the laser beam has moved too far upwards as seen by this first order diffraction maxima is now coming in contact with this track here. Because it's, it's going over the bumps now, before it wasn't, there's intensity change. Notice that this other one is not. Okay, now because this one is returning a signal that, okay, my intensity is changing, the mechanisms in the CD correct this and will make the laser beam move back down, correcting its direction back into this sort of position is seen over here. Okay, so uh, in the other case, well, what if the laser beam was to move too far down? Well, in that case, this one here is returning a signal that says, hey, I'm at I'm, re I'm getting intensity changes. You need to make the correction back in my direction. So the, if this one is sending a signal, this one is not. This one's returning a signal saying, hey, you need to get back on track. It will correct upwards. So in this way, the main central beam will stay on track by updating from uh, corrections that have been um, communicated by the intensity changes of these first order diffraction patterns. So that's the other part of this that you need to know. How the laser stays on track, uses the first order diffraction maximums and the same change in intensity patterns, but it's not reading it as if it was information. It's literally, if there is an intensity change, it, it knows where to go to correct it. And then once it goes back to this pattern, there's no uh, intensity changes for the first order maximum it will remain on track until it gets a signal that says you've got to correct again. And it's going to do this a lot because it, it pretty much, the only way it spirals outwards is by getting um, signals from um, either source that, okay, you need to correct. So it will move until it goes back to this. So it's always going to be doing this throughout um, the cycle. This thing spins quite fast. It's going to fall off track quite a lot. And, but the, this feedback information keeps it uh, following the path of the information, even if it spirals outwards. So that's how that works. All right, we're going to leave it there. That's all the information you critically need to know for this topic.